Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Today, we're here to discuss a critical aspect of the pharmaceutical industry, blend homogeneity. Uh, the title of our research paper is called Optimization of Blend Uniformity in the Pharmaceutical Industry, and we are Akshara Bhatt, Gabriel Schlachman, and myself, Eva Shu. Um, <laughs> to give you a brief overview of the pharmaceutical industry, you have four main stages, as you can see up here. We start off with drug discovery, which is where chemists are involved in the actual process of finding the API, also known as the active pharmaceutical ingredient, which is the main therapeutic <coughs> the drug, and the target, which is the location in the body where the drug needs to get to in order to perform its desired function. Then you have drug development and manufacturing, and these are the two places where the engineers are involved <coughs> in optimizing the equipment. In the development phase, you have engineers working to optimize it on a small scale to see how it works with the API and with the target. And then in the manufacturing scale, you scale it up to the factory level to see how it works with larger blends. Finally, you have sales and distribution, where the product is put into a pill form and then uh, packaged and distributed and put onto the shelf where you as a consumer can buy it and consume it. Um, to give a brief definition of blend uniformity, it is a homogeneous concentration of a drug that is achieved from optimal blending. You have two extremes that you want to avoid when you have blend uniformity, having too much API and too little API. If you have too much of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, it can lead to toxic side effects and potential death due to having too much of that compound interacting with parts of your body. Whereas if you have too little API, it can lead to not actually performing the threat function that the API is designed to. Um, three main problems that are uh, able to occur when blending are segregation, <coughs> insufficient particle distribution, and sampling error. So segregation is when particles separate based on size and density, leading to like an uneven patch. You have insufficient particle distribution, which is um, demonstrated in this diagram right here. You have the thin, finer particles at the top and at the center, and you have the heavier particles falling down to the sides, and that makes this blend not consistent. And finally, a sampling error, which is when you don't take a sample from multiple parts of the blend, but rather choose one specific part, which doesn't give you a broad view of the entire blend's This is a diagram illustrating particle segregation. Up at the top, you have the unmixed state, and you see the two separate components uh, that are not blended together just yet. You have the actual state of mixing, which is, um, as you can see here, a very random process. And you want to avoid what's happening right here, which is the aggregation of particles on one side or another, because you want what's down here, the ideal state of mixing, which is when the particles are separated evenly. <coughs> this is what's designed in an industry and what's trying to be optimal. Um, two main methodologies used in this uh, particular area are blenders and analytical equipment. So the three blenders that we particularly researched were the B-blender, the whole and continuous blender, although there are numerous different blenders that operate in the industry that you can choose from. We specifically worked with the B and the double cone blenders when performing our experiment, but we also will talk about the continuous blender later on in the um, analytical equipment, we worked with near infrared spectroscopy and then scammer software, but other equipments that can be used include high performance liquid chromatography, ultraviolet spectroscopy, mid wavelength infrared spectroscopy, and then the bottom two, which is what we use because near infrared spectroscopy is usually used in the industry. So, Gabrielle will go into the bottom two and how we use them in so near infrared spectroscopy, NIR, is a new analytical method employed in the pharmaceutical industry in order to determine the composition of a blend batch. The way the machine works is using a fiber optical probe, um, infrared light, which is light between the 800 to 2500 uh, nanometer range, is sent through the sample and reflected back. The data that we get looks like this graph over here. Um, on the x-axis, you have the wavelength in nanometers, and on the y-axis, you have the absorbance. Taking um, samples of each one and getting these readings, you can then um, compare that to your calibration curve, which you can set it on a scrambler and ultimately determine the percentage of the API concentration that you have in your sample. So, in our experiment, we tried to optimize the 
making of Tylenol, there are two main components. There's the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, which is the therapeutic component, which is actually what helps you, what heals you. And then you, you use the steam medicine for that. You also have the excipient, which is anything that's a filler in the drug. So in this case, we had uh, microcrystalline cellulose, which is what helps it get to the right location in the body, get out easily. And then you have a lubricant, which is in the manufacturing of the drug, would ultimately make sure that it doesn't stick to any of the particles and will go through the uh, manufacturing process smoothly. And in that case, we use magnesium steroids. So in our experiment, in order to determine what is the most optimal uh, blending process, we set different variables in order to determine which one actually affects the homogeneity of the blend the most. And so we had uh, two different types of blenders. We varied the percentage of the compositions, different RPM or rotation speeds, the amount of time, and we took samples from different locations for the blender. So here's the data that we got through the double clone. We did the same thing for the V blender. Um, so at first, we uh, varied the percent of magnesium stearate. So we varied it between 0.2 and 1%, um, and then tested using the NIR, the percentage of API that we got after missing this. So ultimately from this, we determined that 0.6% of magnesium stearate resulted in the highest percentage of API. So we continued and held that as a constant, and from there we varied the rotation speed. So we had 12.5 and 25.2, that was the rotations per minute. And ultimately we determined that the more rotations you, uh, the most more rotations you, the more optimal and homogeneous your blend will be. So holding that constant, we then varied the time. We had one batch going for eight minutes and one going for 16 minutes. And after testing that, we realized that time really didn't affect the results in the double clone blender um, as much as other things. So here are some of our results and the implications of those results. So in trying to optimize um, in the V blender, you can see that an increase in RPM in our, um, in our um, case didn't really affect ultimately the uh, homogeneity of the blend. However, in standard industry um, pro uh, production of this, it actually does affect it, except in a smaller scale in our sense, it didn't. Um, when looking at increasing the time from 8 minutes to 60 minutes, there was a 14% increase in the API concentration, um, showing that time in the feed blender does optimize the uh, homogeneity of the blend. So looking at the double cone in order to optimize the conditions there, um, if you increase the RPM or the rotation speed, there's a 9.5 increase in the API percentage. Um, and when looking at time, there was no major impact, showing that time in the double cone really doesn't affect the homogeneity of the blend. However, it's also important to realize that our experiments were done on a smaller scale. However, when you scale up in the, in the industry and look at bigger batch blends and bigger uh, blenders, you need to look at different variables or the same variables, how they can affect the, uh, the blend differently. It's also important to realize that while we were going for ultimately 5% of our acetaminophen, our API, where we got 3.23 was the highest amount, it's actually an accepted amount in the industry because of the nature of blend uniformity and how it's not easily attained. While we tried to eliminate as many errors as we could, some errors were inevitable, such as human error, which could have been found through measuring, sampling, or even reading the data. <coughs> Furthermore, the very nature of blending is random, meaning that as the powders rotate through either the bee blender or the double cone blender, there will always be some type of particle segregation where heavier particles fall to the bottom of the mix and the lighter particles disperse at the top. Even after the mixing process, there can still be particle segregation where particle density and particle size uh, have a play as it sits in a glass vial before being measured. And finally, because we work on a smaller scale, like Gabrielle said, some samples are really, really small, and the components inside that can be less than 0.2% of the actual sample makes it hard for the NIR to get an accurate read of it. To try and fix these issues in the industry, new methods have developed such as the continuous manufacturing process. And this is where one can determine the percent composition of the blunt as it goes directly through the machine, rather than the more standard way, which we did, where we had the blend, we made the blend, and then we only sampled it afterwards. Furthermore, because our, our, our experiment was so small and the industry is so large, there's different factors affecting the industry that can have a larger impact on the manufacturing process of drug development. 
However, what we do have in common, our experiment and the industry, is where we use the NIR, which is a widely acclaimed analytical tool that is employed. Overall, though, there is no ideal way, no standard way to make um, a certain batch of pill or like powder. Therefore, the pharmaceutical industry is still developing even today, and pharmaceutical engineers try to optimize blend uniformity as much as we can, and the industry is still expanding. This concludes our presentation, and now we would just like to take this time to thank everyone who has helped us. Um, especially Josh, who was our counselor, who assisted us, and our mentors, Sarah and Kuzia. Thank you.